impossible thing that no way we could ever do that. Let's say, God, fill us with the fullness of God. And so the next question I have is this. What is the process that Paul prays should happen for the Ephesians and us? And I want you to remember all those in order that. I mean, that's a process, right? In order that. You just can't lift a phrase out of the Bible and grab a hold of it. You've got to see how it flows within the context. And so I want to kind of tear this prayer apart a little bit so that I might know the process. And I see four things in this scripture, okay? First of all, being filled with the fullness of God is the result of prayer. It's a result of prayer. This is about receiving something from seeking God. Why? Be- because it's the end result and the object of Paul's prayer. If we didn't need to pray for this, Paul would have never written this in the form of a prayer. This was something that he wanted to pray us to pray about today. And how interesting that Paul doesn't really pray the kind of prayer for the church that most of us pray, right? He doesn't pray for the people, let them all have good jobs, Lord, and uh, let them all have comfortable lives, let their 401ks grow. And No, 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 he doesn't talk about any of that. No, 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 no. He, his material is just about his, 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 he doesn't ask for anything material, just spiritual blessings. Let's look again, he says, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father. Right? How many know that's a posture of prayer? That's coming to God in humility. You bow down before God. What you're doing is you're recognizing His supremacy and your need, right? The peasants used to bow down to the king, right? Because they knew who He was. And that's what we do. We bow down to the Lord because we know that He's the great giver. Come on, give the Lord a, a hand of praise today. And then we have to understand that, that, that this blessing comes from The riches of His glory. The riches of His glory. That's the same place where we get our needs met. Do you realize that? The Scripture says this, My God shall supply all your needs according to what? His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He's going to give us the fullness of God from this very same place as that comes from. And He goes on to say here, it says, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you. This is something that God gives, right? God gives it to you according to the riches of His glory. And let me tell you something I want you to understand. Paul is writing to believers. He's writing to believers. If you go to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 1, you're going to discover that he was writing to saints. Did you know that you're a saint? Not like, you know, in the t- traditional religion of a saint, but people are saints because they're called out. They're holy, made holy by God, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, right? We are saints. Now, wait a minute. Does that mean that just because you're a saint, you have everything? How many of you know, a lot of people think when they get born again, they accept Christ into their life, they think they've got everything. I feel sorry for those people because you know when you're a baby, you don't have anything. You're dependent upon everybody for everything. Am I right? Born again means that you're a baby. And if you're a baby Christian, if you're walking in the... You need the kingdom of God. You need to grow. You grow and you, and you, you start with the milk of the Word and you move to the meat of the Word. And, and, and so uh, you, you know, if you think that you've received everything that there is and you've got all of God that you'll ever need and that you've experienced everything that there is... Let me tell you something. I feel so sorry for you because God is so much greater than that. He's so much more powerful that, than that. He has so many more facets than that come on we don't have everything that we need from the Lord amen God is so much more and you know I've I've never really heard anybody walking around touting this phrase saying oh I'm filled with all the fullness of God oh hallelujah look at me if they were I would have to tell them well you know you need to get a little bit more humility because if you were really filled with the fullness of God you wouldn't be boasting about it come on do I have a witness in the house today amen so so what I'm trying to say is that it comes from prayer and then being filled with all the fullness of God is the result of the continual strengthening of the Holy Spirit in your inner being, right? That's what it says, Ephesians 3.16, to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, right? If you're going to walk 
be in the fullness of God, you have to have the Holy Spirit with you to strengthen you on a daily, moment by moment basis. Is there anybody that's grateful for the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is not some, you know, some power. No, the Holy Spirit is a person. He's the third person of the Trinity, and He's the one that's called right alongside of you, and He's there to give you inner strength. He's there to give you might. Amen. And, and it's not just a one time experience, you know, where somebody speaks in other tongues or something like that. This is about relationship with the Holy Spirit. There are moments in your heart when you need strengthening, right? You're wanting to fill yourself with other things. How many of you know the world fills itself up with a lot of things? How many of you realize that in order to be filled with the fullness of God, you've got to be like Jesus and empty yourself out? Did you know that Jesus actually did that? The book of Philippians chapter 1, uh, I mean, chapter, one of those chapters in there in Philippians tells us that the Lord, that Jesus emptied himself. He let it all go. He emptied himself of his deity to be filled with the Spirit. And we've got to empty ourselves. Amen. And so what happens is that the Holy Spirit comes in and he, and he causes us to become strong. And when we read the Word, he applies the Word to our life. And what happens is, is as we allow that Spirit to touch us and strengthen us and encourage us, our inner man gets bigger. There was an old preacher of yesteryear called Smith Wigglesworth. How many of you heard of him? Man, he had a lot more courage than I have. The Lord would tell him, just go up there and punch that guy in the stomach and he'll be healed. I'm not doing that. I don't have that much faith. But Smith Wigglesworth did. You want to know what he said? He, he told people, he said, I'm about a thousand times bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. You want to know what that came from? The continual strengthening of the Holy Spirit in his life. And so what this phrase tells me is that the Holy Spirit wants to interact with us in everything that we are, everything that we do, how we feel, where, where we go, how we respond at our work, at our job, in our car, come on, in the store, watching TV with our kids. The Holy Spirit wants to be right there enlarging us and making us all that we need to be. Come on, can we give a hand of praise for the Holy Spirit today. And then it's also the result of dwelling, of Christ dwelling in our hearts through faith. That's what it says. Ephesians 3.17 that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And you know it's easy for us as people today of learning and education to read something and we grab it kind of quickly and then we move over it. But when you meditate on that word dwell, it's a powerful word. It's an incredible word. Because you see, that's been the heart of God all along. Way back in Adam's day, God wanted to dwell with mankind. All right, you go back and you study the tabernacle and the temple in the Old Testament. And, and the reason why God had them do all of that was because, you see, God wanted to come down and dwell among his people. That was his goal. That was, that was the heart of God. And how have you know that the word dwell doesn't mean I'm coming to visit you? <laughs> it means I'm coming to stay. I'm coming to move. I'm moving in. I'm bringing all my stuff, everything. I'm coming to dwell with you. Hey, how many of you say, I, I don't want the Lord to visit my house. I want him to live there. I want him to dwell there. I want him to abide there. Come on. I want him to move in. And actually, that's the ultimate goal of God with mankind. If you read the book of, of Revelation, you'll see that in the, when he creates the new heaven and the new earth, this is what he says. It says there's this declaration given. It says, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will what? Dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And the beautiful thing is that Christ wants to dwell inside of you. Inside of you. You are the temple of Christ. He dwells on the inside of you. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Amen. Amen. And then we've got to realize that this is also a result of having received and comprehended his love. I don't know about you, but I'm so grateful for the love of God. A couple of years ago, Doreen came home from work, and I was in my little study there where I was listening to a song on YouTube. It's an old one called The Love of God. How many of you ever heard that? Could we with ink the oceans fill? That song talks about the love of God. And 
I was overwhelmed by the love of God. I, I mean, I had listened to that song for about an hour and a half. Uh, you say, Pastor, that's kind of weird. No, no, man. I just got into the presence of God. And the presence of God was flowing over me. And I was crying. And I was thanking Him. You know, I was, th I was thinking, oh, if it weren't for the love of God, where would I be? You know, I'm a sinner. I, I need His forgiveness. I need His love. I need His grace. And I'm so grateful for the love of God. Is there anybody that's grateful for the love of God? Amen. Because God loves us. And, and, uh, Paul tells us that we've got to be rooted and grounded in love. This is what it says. It says being rooted and grounded in love that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. And it's difficult for me really to grasp the love of God. And it's almost incomprehensible. But when you get your heart, when you get your mind around it, it's incredible. I mean, how high is the love of God? It goes all the way to the heavens. It's going to go all the way through eternity. That in the ages of come, he, that to come, He's going to show us His riches and all the different facets of God. How deep is it? Let me tell you something. It'll reach all the way down to Skid Row. It'll reach all the way down to the lowest place that humanity can fall. Come on, somebody give the Lord a hand of praise. How long is it? Let me tell you something. You can't wear it out. Come on. It is, an, it is an everlasting love. How wide is it? It's wide enough to go all around the world. Come on. Can we put our hands together in praise just for the love of God that's found in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so the key is this. We, when we grow to an understanding of that love, then we're filled with the fullness of the knowledge. That we're filled with the fullness of God. And so when those three are present, how many of you are with me? When the Spirit of God is strengthening us, this is what we need in order to make this happen in our lives. When the Spirit of God is with us, strengthening us. When Christ is dwelling on the inside of us. Isn't that what it says? When we get a grasp of how great the love of God is, let me tell you something, something supernatural happens. All of a sudden, the glory of the eternal God of heaven begins to fill us. Woo. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I want that, to be filled with all the love of God. 